for now. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I'll start the streaming now to make sure that it comes on. Sure. Um, I usually start. And uh, let me share the screen here. Well, quick. Exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll start the oh, streaming uh, now to make sure it comes on. Got it. Sorry. This is share. Open this you can hear me okay, uh, by the way, Harold? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Hear sorry. You. It's the new passport. Yeah, it's good to find that you're a panelist, so I have somebody to look at besides just exactly. having... I'll keep my camera on then. <laughs> no, actually, this way people will. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. Later. Oh, shoot. Okay, so I cannot uh, share it, turns out, myself. <laughs> because it's a new computer, I, I don't want to restart it, otherwise you guys will come off. Um, uh, so I would like to welcome everybody um, uh, back uh, to the online Spice Spin Classic seminars. Uh, as you know, uh, this is uh, led by me, by Harris Nova and uh, Angela Wittmann um, in here, Mainz, and Karen Ebersol City in Duisburg in collaboration with the SPIN Plus X uh, collaborative, collaborative Research Center uh, in collaborating Casas um, Latin by Martin Ash Lehmann, uh, Burka Hillebrands, added here in Mainz by Matthias Chloe. We will uh, typically have the talks on Wednesday, but notice that now we will only have one more in, left in the summer and the 13th of, uh, of July. And after that, because of the SPICE workshops on the break that we're gonna have in the summer, we'll restart in September. Yeah, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Ankit Disa. He is now a fresh assistant professor at Cornell, uh, full of beans and energy. Uh, and I was extremely uh, impressed uh, by a talk that I heard from him a month ago, and I was keen very much on inviting him. Uh, he works on engineering magnetic and electronic properties of quantum materials on ultra short time scales, but also to create in this time domain, different qualities of, uh, on the effect of materials uh, and has had quite a few hours already and did a career at Center for Humboldt Research Fellowship and APS Division of Materials Physics Office of Student Award uh, and some NSF grants uh, fellowships as well. And the Cornell AEP Dorothy and the Field Chow Award. Uh, so with this, we'll ask you, Anik, uh, to please go ahead and uh, uh, share your screen. And uh, let's start your talk. Okay. Uh, you have the screen? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Jairo. Thanks for that very nice introduction and um, really for giving me the opportunity to present here. I, I think probably a lot of us have maybe Zoom fatigue by now, but I think the SPI seminars are still kind of a nice and uh, exciting platform to to hear and discuss research. So thank you all for organizing it and for inviting me to be to be part of this. As Jairo said, I am Ankitisa. I am I'm now starting a new group at uh, Cornell. But for the last several years, I've been in Hamburg at the Max Planck Institute for the Structure and Dynamics of Matter and um, working with Andrea Cavallari there. And, and the work that I'll tell you about today was carried out, out there in, in Hamburg is, is work that I led with a number of different people at the Max Planck Institute. And the goal of what I will try to tell you about in the next 45 minutes or so is, is kind of what's going on in this image here, uh, using light to manipulate magnetic order and in particular to create non-equilibrium um, magnetic states with desirable properties. And I'll tell you, how we actually accomplish this in slightly unusual ways by exploiting the ability to actually engineer the crystal lattice of materials with light. So before I get started, I almost always run out of time at the end to do this. So I wanna first acknowledge some of the people who, who made this work possible. As I said, a number of people at the Max Planck Institute. Um, I would specifically wanna point out Michelle Fechner uh, and John Curtis from uh, the Pranaya Naran group, at, um, formerly at Harvard, for, for theory support and the Keimer and Oxford groups for high quality samples. So I'm gonna start very broadly and then slowly zoom into the specific experiments and motivations that I'm, I will be talking about. And on the most basic level, what I wanna say is that the goal of the research that I, and I'm sure many of, many of you out there listening to this talk uh, work on is to find ways to control the functional behavior of materials. 
in, in this community, the spice community, magnetism is often uh, the big focus, but whether it is magnetic, optical, electronic, um, or structural, the ability to tune the microscopic properties of materials is ultimately what allows us to create devices for storing and processing information, harvesting, energy sensing, and, and so on. Basically all the functionality is that, that we use materials for. And so what I've been, I'm interested in and in, in trying to figure out is how we actually can do that. And there are probably as many approaches to controlling functional behavior in materials as there are people listening today. But what, what we can do is start by noticing that many of the useful functionalities come from symmetry broken states. So here uh, you have a, a magnetic state, here you have ferroelectric that, that is used to store information. And so these break you know, time reversal and, and inversion symmetries respectively. And so the simplest thing I can do, I can think of to, trying to do is to use our knowledge of symmetry breaking phase transitions to understand how we can manipulate um, this order, right? So in, in the framework of symmetry breaking phase transitions, I can use our, our Landau, our textbook Landau theory, and we can consider the thermodynamic free energy of the system. And we know that close to a phase transition, I can expand the free energy and powers of the order parameter. And so for concreteness here, I will take a ferromagnetic system and with a second order phase transition, and then I can write out the coefficients of the expansion in this way and uh, with the temperature dependence here on the quadratic term. And then as a function of temperature, the minimum of this free energy is going to tell me what the equilibrium state of the system is, right? So for my ferromagnetic material, the free energy will look like, like this as a function of, of uh, magnetization at high temperatures. You will have a minimum at zero, so the system is not magnetized, it's in its paramagnetic state. And then when we reduce the temperature below Tc, the free energy becomes a double well and the system will now lie at a new minimum, which is now at a finite value of, of M corresponding to the magnetization of this ferromagnetic phase. And these two minima are now the two possible magnetization states. And so what we wanna be able to do is, is kind of go between these different states. We can incorporate the interaction, uh, for example, with uh, an external field. Here, we can take advantage of the dipolar coupling between the external magnetic field and the magnetization. And then we can see from this term that basically applying this perturbation will change the shape of this free energy and provides us a way to go from one magnetic state to another. Okay, this is very simple. I basically just took a long time to tell you that magnetic fields can switch the magnetization in a ferromagnet, which we all know. But the point was that uh, we can see from this that the symmetry of the system dictates how I can couple to it and uh, in order to switch its state and control its functionality. And so this will work obviously in some cases like in this ferromagnetic case, but it will not work in, in all cases. This is limited uh, in its applicability to certain systems. And a simple counterexample to show you when this doesn't work that easily is uh, in an antiferromagnet, where here we have a staggered magnetic moment on each site instead of the same magnetic moment on each site. We have no net magnetization. And so the description above won't work. You cannot couple a magnetic field linearly to uh, to switch the state of an antiferromagnet. And so in principle, uh, one requires the equivalent of alternating a magnetic field on each side so that we can switch the antiferromagnetic domain. And I love this picture because it just shows you how, how difficult it is to envision literally doing such a thing. And so um, what I'm after is trying to understand are there alternative approaches, more general approaches for um, controlling microscopic phases of, of materials, for example, uh, this more complex magnetic order. And now one can get down to a microscopic level rather than this, uh, this macroscopic picture and try to understand what ingredients are important for endowing the system with its particular microscopic properties. And what I would argue is that the crystal structure is one of the most fundamental and powerful ways for, for tuning functionality. And for magnetism, I think the case is easily made. The crystal structure directly impacts the exchange interaction between the spins through uh, bond angles and bond lengths, the different nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, and so on. These are all determined uh, largely by you know, how far apart the atoms are and what the, the bonding environment is. And uh, in addition, the local symmetry, for example, the crystal crystallographic sites, the crystal field, they determine the magnetic anisotropy of the allowed spin orbit interactions and so on. And so clearly here, the crystal structure uh, allows you to, to change the magnetic properties of the system 
More generally, in many different types of materials and settings, the behavior of the crystal lattice uh, and the electronic charges, orbitals, and spins are all uh, very closely intertwined. And so in the free energy picture that I showed you before, taking all this into account gives rise to an extremely complicated energy landscape with a number of nearly degenerate phases because of the cooperation and competition between all these different degrees of freedom. But and one of the big consequences is that is that you have always, in, in, in almost all cases, an extreme sensitivity between uh, the structure and the functionality of the material, and you can use this to control a wide array of electronic and magnetic phases. Okay, and so let me show you a simple yet demonstrative example of, of what I mean. Uh, I will take here uh, the case of transitional metal oxides, which are a common class of functional materials. I'll come back to them later. And let's consider one such oxide, strontium vanadate. It's a relatively simple system. It has a cubic uh, perovskite crystal structure where the vanadium ions sit in the center of this cube. And it has one active uh, D uh, electron living in this vanadium D orbital. And these electrons can talk to each other by hopping through these intermediary oxygens, right? And in this particular structure, the bond angles are quite straight, so it's easy for the electrons to move, and the system is therefore metallic. Now, if you look at similar compounds, all with the same electronic configuration, but with slightly distorted crystal structures from one another, you find something quite interesting and dramatic. So normally, these should all have very similar properties. You, they all have the same number of electrons uh, and the same orbitals involved. But what you find is that some of these are metals and some of these are insulators. And uh, you also find that some of these are paramagnets uh, at all temperatures. Some of these are antiferromagnets and some of these are ferromagnets. And these phase transitions all occur due to relatively small changes in the bond angles and bond lengths that essentially dictate the ratio between all those different energy scales in the system. And I'll come back to this example again later, but it just shows you that you have this ability to tune between lots of different types of, of macroscopic phases by, by small changes in the crystal structure. And so, uh, you know, this structure provides us a knob to, to take some desirable phase or property and to change it so that we can, for example, switch between uh, states and take advantage of some particular functional response. We can change the temperature of a different phase transition. We can try to induce new phases. But um, in equilibrium, there are some issues that can, of course, apply pressure or synthesize new materials with different compositions to achieve this, this type of structural control. But it has its limitations, it has its downsides. Uh, for example, we would ideally want something that is fast and dynamical for some functionality. Moreover, we would want, uh, we, we are still interested in, uh, we are still, let's say, limited by the equilibrium phase diagram. And sometimes the, the state that we are most interested in live at very low temperatures or, or very high pressures. And so what we'd like to really be able to do is somehow go beyond the equilibrium phase diagram so that we can enhance the desired phenomena and maybe even induce uh, different phases and functionalities that don't exist through this equilibrium approach. And so the ap approach that I will uh, tell you about that I will try to use is to drive a material with light uh, to push it into a non-equilibrium state, into a different direction. So, and ultimately this can lead to different types of behavior which can be controlled on ultra-fast ultra timescales and often uh, beyond what's possible in the equilibrium setting. Okay, and so what I will basically tell you about in the rest of the talk is how we can actually achieve this type of control uh, using light. And as I said, the basic idea is instead of a, a static approach where we would just uh, tune different crystal structures uh, in in different types of uh, in different um, different types of compounds, the idea is to dynamically control the system's properties and phases. And so the question is, why should this work? What advantage does the dynamical control give us that, let's say, the static control doesn't? Right. There are some obvious answers, but I will show you something uh, a little less obvious um, and in a very simple example. And so what I'll show you here is what's called Kapitz's pendulum. This is a very famous and simple example of a, of a dynamical system. It's basically a, a pendulum, your no, no, usual pendulum reacting to the force of gravity. But in addition, the pivot point is going to be driven up and down. And so when I run this, what you'll see, yeah, uh, is the usual pendulum behavior. But as the frequency of this parametric drive of the pivot point is increased, at some point you reach a situation where the system 
uh, reaches a stable condition there in which the ball is now pointing up instead of down. And so what was an unstable equilibrium point is now become a, a stable, uh, let's say non-equilibrium or dynamically driven uh, point. And so the concept is obviously not new. This is a classical system, but it just demonstrates that driven systems can often be quite different. Dynamical systems can be often be quite different and they can exhibit different regimes of stability with respect to equilibrium. And so this is kind of the, the basis of this approach that we want to be able to use to control the properties of materials beyond what, what is normally possible. And so one of the reasons that optical driving in particular is so appealing is that you can tune the frequency of light to match the characteristic energy scale of the various degrees of freedom that you're interested in. For example, charge, uh, the charge orbital or lattice degrees of freedom that I talked about. And so, um, you know, this is somewhat obvious. This is how optical spectroscopy works, but in the context of, of driving materials with light, it's also powerful because you can take advantage of the selectivity to address specific collective modes that you're interested in. Right. So, for example, at very low frequencies, you have magnons, we can address the magnetic order. And at very high frequencies, we have uh, electronic excitations. And a lot of work in, in sort of this field of ultrafast optical control has, has focused on the higher energy side here, directly exciting electrons and using various interactions to then uh, lead to new, new types of, of behavior. But in, in Hamburg, and in my own research, what we focused on is taking advantage rather uh, to the sensitivity to the changes in crystal structure that I talked about uh, earlier. And, and so what that requires is then driving uh, lattice vibration, collective uh, lattice vibrations or optical phonons, which typically lie in this terahertz to mid infrared range. And then we can take advantage of all of that structural, uh, that structural sensitivity to tune the phases as we desire. And so the goal has been trying to achieve, uh, the, draw, the goal we've been trying to achieve is then to use light to uh, really dynamically engineer the crystal lattice by resonantly exciting these vibrational modes. And to do so, we need to be able to have um, intense tunable sources of, of light uh, that, can, that can pump these uh, optical phonons uh, and drive these lattice vibrations. So we spent a lot of time developing high intensity terahertz sources uh, in Hamburg and and now we can, with, with tabletop optical sources, create terahertz pulses uh, across really this whole range with peak electric fields uh, now approaching on the order of you know, megavolts per centimeter, which allows one to drive in, in some of the best cases, uh, large amplitude atomic motions on the order of several percent of the equilibrium bond distances. And these are really extreme displacements. And with this kind of, um, with, with this kind of atomic motions, the response of the lattice becomes highly nonlinear. And that's very important because we can now use the nonlinearity of the lattice as a tool to access new crystal structures and, and functionalities. And that is, the, that is sort of the approach that we've developed over these years. And let me ex explain to you how um, that type of uh, the basic mechanisms by which we can create new crystal structures with light, how, how that actually works. Okay, so let me, let, let's do this with a very, very simple example. Let's imagine that we have a crystal that has one single uh, vibrational mode that we're interested in, this, this mode that we're calling QIR. This QIR mode is going to carry a dipole so that we can directly uh, couple to it with, our, the laser, uh, with the electric field of our laser pulse. And so what happens when we shine light on this material is the following. We're going to uh, essentially start vibrating this, this optical phonon mode, this lattice vibration. And so this is a little bit like flicking a ball on a pendulum. We're going to kick the atoms out with our, with our laser pulse, and then they're gonna ring back with their natural frequency, this omega IR here, um, and eventually decay back to zero with some decay time. Okay, and this uh, es essentially leads to no average change to the lattice. This is how you know, optical spectroscopy works. We're gonna be able to see what the frequency of that mode is, but we don't, see any change to the crystal structure on timescales longer than the period of the uh, oscillation of that phonon, which are, as I said, are terahertz. So this is you know, happening on, on very fast timescales, tens of femtoseconds or so. Now, what happens when we crank up the strength of our laser pulse is that we now can uh, get to a regime where we have large amplitude motions, and now we can couple to other modes of the system. 
basically we, we start to access the inharmonicity of the crystal lattice rather than working in a, in a harmonic regime. And one consequence of that is that we, we now couple different modes of lattice. So now let's imagine that we have two, uh, two phonon modes in our, in our crystal. One is the original IR mode that, we, that I showed you before. And another is this mode here, let's say it corresponds to the motion of this atom up and down. And uh, I'm calling this one QR. And this is important because R here stands for Raman mode. This mode doesn't carry a dipole. So normally I wouldn't be able to couple to it with light directly, but um, this, uh, the, the, through this uh, nonlinear mechanism, I will be able to drive in. So the way this works is that I now have a different lattice potential. I have the original harmonic potential, uh, harmonic energy of my infrared active mode. Now I have the harmonic energy of this other mode. And I have now higher order terms. And the lowest order term that couples these two modes is this one here, which is coupling the square of the infrared active mode to the linearly to this Raman active mode. Okay, and so what this interaction term tells us is that if we now look at the, the potential energy surface of, of this QR mode, we sit here in equilibrium at, z at zero, which means that you know, there's no displacement of this mode relative to its equilibrium position. And now I'm gonna bring in a really large amplitude laser pulse. I'm gonna shake the atoms up and down. And uh, what happens now is because of this term, the potential of the QR mode is going to be shifted. And so uh, that means that, the, that the, uh, the QR mode will now sit at a new minimum. And this leads to a displacement of the atoms along a particular direction. And importantly, this is a directional force that is being pushed on by this QIR mode. And so there's gonna be a net displacement of the coupled mode. It's not oscillating back and forth. It's actually pushing us into a, a different crystal structure. And so in the time domain, what this kind of looks like is the following, I can write down the equation of the motion from those potential energies that, are, that I showed you before. In red, I show you the time dependence of the infrared active mode after the laser pulse comes, it vibrates back and forth, as I said. And in blue is the motion of this coupled QR mode. You can see it gets pushed in one direction. It has a rectified, for, it has a, uh, a rectified displacement uh, from this infrared active mode. And, and what this looks like is then in this intermediate regime, where the modes are, are being displaced, we have a new crystal structure that's different from the one that we started out with. Okay, and this new crystal structure will have, as I showed you before, different, different properties, different electronic and magnetic properties. And here we can use this as a tool then to, um, to control the electronic and magnetic phases of our materials. Okay, and so this is a very simple toy model, but it actually turns out to work very well in experiments back in 2011. This was verified uh, through some optical experiments. Here I'm just showing you uh, in this compound uh, LSMO, lanthanum strontium manganite, where uh, one of the infrared active modes was driven and uh, optically the uh, a Raman mode was detected. And one can see that you have this uh, displacement of the Raman mode, which is maximal when you're driving resonantly this infrared active mode. And so this resonant coupling between the two uh, modes was, um, was established. And subsequently, uh, X-ray experiments were used to show that, in fact, uh, there really is a, a displacive uh, component to this excitation. The Raman mode is pushed in a particular direction, and you have a different crystal structure that lives for, for a number of picoseconds after the, infrared, after the optical pulse is in, uh, is in put onto the sample, okay? And so this was used in, in early experiments to show, for example, that you can take um, one of these manganites from an insulating state when all the bond angles are very distorted to a metallic state when all the bond angles are, are, are straight by driving uh, this kind of distortion. And it was shown that um, indeed you get a large enhancement in the conductivity and an induced metallic phase by driving this type of vibrational um, distortion. And subsequently, there are many, many other papers that, that have, have shown the ability to use this type of vibrational control for uh, controlling electronic properties, ferroelectricity, superconductivity, and so on. And so what I will now uh, talk about is actually how we can optically engineer crystal structures to, to, um, to control magnetism. And in particular, how we can really induce, enhance, and control non-equilibrium magnetic states uh, in this way. And I'm going to show you two examples. One is 
how we can actually control order in an antiferro magnet, something that I alluded to earlier. And the second is a newer experiment where I showed that we can actually enhance ferromagnetism at temperatures above the equilibrium ordering temperature. Okay, so let me first talk about how we can control order in an antiferro magnet. Um, again, to motivate this, the idea is that you know, we have in most of our technologies, currently we're using ferromagnets, which are easy to switch, but they have a number of limitations. And antiferromagnets, if we were able to use them, uh, would be able to uh, alleviate many of these limitations. They could be packed more densely, they could be switched faster because of the faster uh, magnonic time scales, and they would be more robust to external perturbations. But as I said, the challenge is that it is difficult to, to control the state of an antiferromagnet. And so uh, the question is, can we use light? Can we use this ability to engineer the crystal structure then to manipulate order in an antiferromagnet to try to bridge this gap? Okay, and so the experiment we carried out was on a very prototypical antiferromagnet. This, uh, this uh, material is called cobalt fluoride. It uh, has BCC, uh, it's a BCC antiferromagnet. It's one of the simplest ones you can think of. It was studied back in the 50s um, as one of the early examples of antiferromagnetism. Uh, it has a BCC lattice of cobalt ions. Um, each of the cobalt ions is surrounded by an octahedron of fluorine ions. And normally, uh, the this cobalt in the center of, the, uh, of this cube uh, have a magnetic moment that's equal and opposite to the one in the corner corner of the cube. And so it is a fully compensated C-axis uh, antiferromagnet magnet with no net magnetic field. The nail temperature is 38. Uh, so with no net magnetization, the nail temperature is 38 Kelvin. However, what's interesting about this compound is that when I apply a uniaxial stress along the in-plane diagonal direction, what happens is that the two sublattices actually become decompensated. One of the uh, magnetizations gets bigger and the other gets smaller. And so you end up with a net ferrimagnetic magnetization, which develops along the C-axis. And this magnetization is proportional to the applied stress on the system. And this is called the uh, piezomagnetic effect. This is linearly coupling the stress to the magnetization. And it is an effect that can occur in a subset of magnetic systems that break um, some specific symmetry. And so this is actually a, a quite a useful effect. And to understand where this comes from in in cobalt fluoride, it's easiest to actually look at this crystal from the top. So here I'm showing you a top view of the same crystal. Um, here is the cobalt and here is the fluorine. And the important feature underlying the piezomagnetic effect here is that the, sorry, is the uh, orbital moment of the cobalt ions here. And the cobalt ion and the orbital moment is, is unquenched. It's a cobalt D7 system. And so uh, this, this moment is going to be dependent then on the splitting between the T2G orbitals uh, of the cobalt ion. And this splitting is dependent um, largely on the in-plane cobalt fluorine bond length. Without strain, the, the bond lengths are the same for the cobalt in the center and the corner of the cube. And so you have the same orbital moment on the two sides. But when you apply a, a uniaxial stress, one of the bond lengths gets shorter and one of the bond lengths gets longer. And so you, lead, you have a net difference in the orbital moment between the two sites, leading to uh, uh, this very magnetic polarization and a net magnetization in the system. Okay, and so this allows us structurally to, to control magnetization uh, bidirectionally. It's a linear effect, so we control, control both the magnitude and the direction of the uh, induced magnetization and gives us a new knob to control antiferromagnetic order. But it has a number of disadvantages, which are the same that I talked about earlier, because this is done with, a, with a, an actual physical stress that's applied to the system. You're limited to the uh, pressures that you can achieve, meaning the maximum magnetizations that you can achieve, and the time scales are gonna be limited to uh, acoustic time scale. And so the question is, can we overcome uh, these limitations by driving the crystal structure with light? And I'll show you that we can, uh, but the question is, you know, how do we actually do that? How can we drive the same type of distortion as this one um, with light? And so what we need to do is look at how to emulate uniaxial strain um, optically. And we can do that by looking at the symmetry of the strain uh, that is imposed on the system. And so the symmetry, if we look at the symmetry of the strain, we can see a couple of things. One is that this, uh, this strain displacement breaks the C4 symmetry 
uh, uh, of the of the crystal and it has an anti is anti symmetric with respect to the C four symmetry. It breaks the X Y mirror planes of the of the crystal. It's actually anti symmetric with respect to those X Y mirror planes, and it preserves inversion. Okay, and so all of these things tell us that the, the, what the strain is, has is B2G symmetry. Okay, this is an XY in plane uniaxial strain, and so it has B2G symmetry. And so what that means is that we can find a phonon with the same symmetry, we should be able to drive the same distortions. And indeed, there's a B2G symmetric phonon, Raman phonon in the material. And if you look at the displacements corresponding to this phonon, you can see that, that indeed it has the same anti-symmetric uh, changes in the cobalt fluorine bond lengths as, as you get with strain. One of the bond lengths gets longer and the other gets shorter. And so if I were able to drive this uh, distortion, I could get a net magnetization in the same way. Here, the magnetization will be proportional to the displacement of this Rama mode, uh, but I'm not going to be limited to the last, by the elastic constraints of the, of the crystal because this is an optical phonon mode that preserves the volume of the unit cell. Okay, but the caveat here is that I have to somehow break the underlying symmetry of the lattice to be able to excite this mode. Okay, so how can I do that? Uh, I, sh I talked about before using the, the anharmonicity of the crystal lattice to, uh, and the nonlinearity uh, of, of driving the crystal strongly with light to um, lead to a new crystal structure. There, I talked about two phonon modes. In order to break the symmetry, basically without going into details, what you need are three phonon modes. And you take advantage of a three phonon interaction now between two infrared active modes and one Raman active mode. And based on the symmetry of the, of the system, uh, what this interaction tells me is that if I have two infrared active modes, one oriented along the A axis and one oriented along the B axis, and they are degenerate, then they will couple to uh, sp specifically or preferentially to a, a Raman mode of B2G symmetry. And they will provide a force that pushes, as I showed you before, this Raman mode displacively in a particular, dire uh, in a particular direction and give us a net magnetization. So the goal of, the, of what we want to be able to do is basically to simultaneously excite to, uh, to generate infrared active forms along A and B, to activate this type of coupling and generate the net magnetization. What, to show you just what this looks like um, uh, in real time, I think this, it's kind of helpful. Here, what we're going to do is excite these two infrared active modes. We're going to, uh, we would essentially vibrate these modes back and forth. And you can see that in addition to this vibration, there is this displacement that happens. Let me show you again really quickly. Here's the vibration of the infrared active modes going back and forth. And you can see that on top of that, there is this, this uni, unidirectional displacement. This bond lines get longer and this bond lines get smaller. And so that, that's really what's happening microscopically in the system. In order to uh, generate that type of displacement, I have to excite these two infrared active modes. As I said, their frequencies lie at 12 terahertz, which is actually a somewhat difficult frequency to access, but we were able to do that with our new um, terahertz sources that we developed in Hamburg. And so the experiment that we ended up carried out is, is to uh, excite these two modes with two orthogonally polarized pulses at 12 terahertz, simultaneously driving them, and, and then uh, looking at, their, uh, at the net magnetization that develops in a simple uh, optical pump probe setup. Okay, and so first we, we send in our terahertz pulses, then I probe the material with a second pulse propagating along the C-axis, and through the, the Faraday effect, a magnetization along the C-axis will lead to a rotation of the plane of the polarization of my probe pulse. And so by measuring the rotation angle of this probe pulse as a function of time delay, I'll resolve the, the pump-induced magnetization and, and uh, to see if we actually induce this, this very magnetic state. Now in reality, just to show you, if we have two orthogonally polarized, linearly polarized pump pulses uh, with a given phase, this actually turns out to just be the same as having a, a, uh, a single linearly polarized pump um, polarized along the, the diagonal. And so actually in reality, we use one, pu one pump that's oriented along the 110 direction of the crystal. Okay, and so when we carry out this experiment, this is what we see. So what I'm showing you here is a plot of the rotation angle as a function of time delay 
the pump arrives here at zero picoseconds along the x-axis. And you can see that before the pump arrives, we have zero uh, rotation angle, which is what we expect in this uh, unstrained antiferro magnet. And then when the pump arrives, we, we see a change in the rotation angle on the time of a few picoseconds. Um, and, then it uh, and, and then it decays uh, back to zero. So uh, that is good, but it actually turns out not to be the whole story at all. We can see that if we zoom out and we look on longer time scales, the rotation angle actually switches sign and gets much, much lar larger, reaching a maximum after a few hundred picoseconds. And this is actually the magnetic system, the signal that we're interested in. And how do we know that? Well, we can do a couple sanity checks. One is that we can carry out the same experiment on non-magnetic systems, zinc fluoride, which has a uh, similar structure, but is not uh, magnetic. And you can see that you have this prompt response, but no long lived uh, response. And we also see the same behavior in, uh, in a circular time resolved circular dichroism measurements. And so uh, we can, these, these things point to this long term Faraday uh, rotation signal as being a signature of the pump induced magnetization that we're imposing by our terahertz pulse. And then we can look at what happens with the signal as a function of temperature. We can characterize this, this pump into state. And we can see that as we warm up from the lowest temperature up to 100 Kelvin, the strength of the signal goes down, eventually reaching zero. And if we extract the maximum rotation signal, uh, it follows quite closely the temperature dependence of the static piezomagnetic effect. And the signal goes down to zero right at the nail temperature as one would expect in the, in, in the case of a piezomagnetic response. And so this provides a kind of a, a confirmation that the effect is analogous to this piezomagnetic effect that I was talking about before, but is driven dynamically with optical phonons on a much faster time scale. And the other thing that you can do with the piezomagnetic effect, as I said, is that you can switch the direction of the magnetization. And the same thing you can do here by switching the phase of one of your infrared active uh, phonons that you drive, you will actually change the, the force that's in, uh, imparted on the system onto this um, B2G Raman mode. And so you'll be able to then switch the direction of the, of the magnetization by changing the phase of this uh, phonon excitation. And this can be done easily by changing the polarization of the pump. Okay, and so you can see uh, here is the same plot that I showed you before, where we're orienting the pump along the 110 direction. And now if I rotate the pump by 90 degrees, which is changing essentially the phase of one of those two phonons, uh, we see that the, the signal actually switches sign. Uh, and so uh, this tells us that the net magnetization switches sign. And so this gives us a confirmation that we have not only a way to control, again, the, the magnitude, but also the direction of the induced magnetization optically. Okay. And, and finally, we can, we can now understand, you know, what is the strength of the effect that we can uh, achieve? Is it bigger than what we can achieve statically? And so we can turn up the peak electric field of our terahertz pulse from one megavolts per centimeter to the strongest we can achieve, which is around uh, 12 megavolts per centimeter. And uh, if you extract the maximum rotation angle, we can plot this as a function of the peak field. We see a couple of things. One is that the uh, dependence is quadratic which is good. This is what we expect, again, from this um, type of three phonon interaction. Each one of these infrared active phonons interacts once with the electric field. And so the, the Raman mode and the net magnetization uh, should scale quadratically, as we expect. And, uh, and then we can now look at what is the, sorry, yeah. We can now look at what is then the strength of the uh, magnetization that we actually induce. So we can convert this maximum rotation angle to an induced magnetization using known magneto-optic coefficients. And we find that we can achieve something close to uh, 0.2 Bohr magnetons per formula unit. And so the question is, is this a big number? Is it something that's useful or just something maybe fun to do in a lab? Well, we can compare this to what is achievable with, with, with static strain. And the largest strain induced magnetization that has been achieved so far is on the order of five times 10 to the minus three Bohr magnetons per formula unit. So obviously our effect is much, much larger than that. But we can say maybe they didn't stretch the crystal uh, large enough. What happens? Um, if you apply enough stress to actually break the crystal, okay? And that in that case, you would reach up to here, which is about two times 10 to the minus two Bohr magnetons per formula unit. And so what we, were, what we are able to achieve is uh, about a hundred times more than what would be statically achievable in the same setting. 
And it's equivalent to applying something like a 50 gigapascal uniaxial press uh, stress. And so the important point is that this uh, ability to create extremely large um, piezomagnetic like magnetizations in an antiferrum is only possible because we're dynamically driving the crystal, exploiting the nonlinear interactions between optical phonons. Okay. And so uh, what that example showed you was that we can control the magnetic state uh, of, a, of our uh, material by, by driving the crystal lattice. We can, in, in a sense, create a better magnetic state by just shining light on the material. And so this is very exciting. But one caveat is that we note that everything here was, was done below the critical temperature. So it's within the existing antiferromagnetic blue order phase. And so everything was at low temperatures below about 40 Kelvin. And so in order to push this further to make this potentially more useful and make this approach potentially more useful, we would like to kind of ask the next question, which is, can we somehow extend this behavior to higher temperatures and induce magnetism above the equilibrium uh, ordering temperature? And what I'll show you now in the next you know, five, uh, five or 10 minutes is, um, is a more recent experiment, still unpublished, where we provide some evidence that this is possible in, in a different material. Okay, so let's switch gears. The material that I'm going to talk about, uh, or the system that I'm going to talk about, are, are, is the system of the rare earth titanates. It's, it's one of the uh, materials that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. These are, are correlated magnets. They are uh, they are orthorhombically distorted uh, perovskites, with uh, the titanium being the most active element. And so uh, microscopically, what's most, most important about these materials is that you have a single titanium electron, which has a spin one half living in uh, this oxygen octahedron. And uh, it has a, a very small orthorhombic distortion so that the, the um, orbitals that are occupied here are uh, are living uh, sorry the electrons are, are occupying uh, uh, this T2G orbital manifold and this T2G levels are somewhat split by this or orthorhombic crystal structure distortion but there's still a fairly large degree of orbital degeneracy in the system okay and so in this type of degenerate T2G system one can see uh, that we end up with a very complex situation from very simple Good enough Kanemori arguments. What uh, what we can know what we know is that how the orbitals are arranged on these various titanium sites within the unit cell will strongly influence the magnetic interactions and the magnetic ground state of the system. That is whether the material will be ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. Okay, so for example, if we had the same orbitals on two different sites, the uh, simple super exchange argument would tell us that the spin interaction would be antiferromagnet, whereas if we had different orbitals, different T2G orbitals on the different sites, we would expect to have um, ferromagnetic spin interactions. And so this, you know, the situation is actually much more complicated in reality, but uh, what we could see is that in, in let's say, in a cubic limit where there's no uh, preferential uh, distortion or preferential orbitals, we have a very highly frustrated system with a highly degenerate ground state and, and strong um, spin orbital fluctuation. And so this limit uh, can be thought of and has been has deemed in some cases an orbital liquid in analogy with this with the spin liquid. But as I said, in, in reality, you have these orthorhombic structural distortions which lifts, lifts, which lifts um, this frustration and chooses a particular orbital ordering pattern. But what is clear is that the magnetism is highly coupled to the crystal lattice and the orbital configuration in this material. Okay. And what that leads to is a, a very uh, strong sensitivity to structural distortions uh, of the magnetic order to the structural distortion. This is um, made very clear in uh, the magnetic phase diagram of this material, which uh, coming from the Takura group. If you start from yttrium titanate and go to lanthanum titanate, so you have a more distorted uh, crystal structure uh, going to a more uh, less distorted crystal structure, you actually go from a ferromagnetic ground state to an antiferromagnetic ground state, okay? And so we end up with uh, the magnetic order being tunable by structural distortions. If uh, what we will focus on here is this ferromagnetic side, yttrium titanate, which has a particular orbital ordering pattern, which, which selects, let's say, the ferromagnetic state. Uh, 
It is a, a mod insulator with a Curie temperature around 27 Kelvin. And it ex but it exhibits, because of this strong coupling between the spins, orbitals, and the lattice degree of freedom, it, it, it exhibits uh, strong fluctuations of the, of the magnetic uh, orbit. And this can be seen in a number of different experiments. For example, here at, at low temperatures, what we find is that there is a suppressed, uh, or there's a suppressed magnetization relative to what you would expect in the ideal spin one half limit. We only reach about 0 0.8 board magnetons per titanium, even with very high temperatures and at very, uh, at very low temperatures and very high fields, um, which is about 20% less than the ideal uh, value that you would expect. And this cannot be explained by um, spin orbit effects or, or um, canting of the, of the moments or anything like that. Moreover, if you look at, at higher temperatures, what we find is that in, in, various, um, in various experiments, we see uh, signatures of magnetic correlations up to very, very high temperatures. For example, we find that there is a, a dependence of certain phonon modes on a, on a magnetic field that lasts up to 100 Kelvin, in thermodynamic measurements of the specific heat and the lattice uh, expansion, we find ma a magnetic contributions, again, uh, up to very, very high temperatures. And uh, up to very, very high temperatures, uh, they set in around, let's say, 100 Kelvin, which is nearly five times TC. And so these types of measurements indicate that in the system, there exists fluctuating magnetic order at very high temperatures, which has been suggested to be a consequence of these spin orbital interactions that I discussed in the last slide. And so what we have here is a strongly interacting system where magnetism can be tuned through the lattice and with, with high temperature precursor cursor fluctuations above the ordered phase. And now we can ask the question, can we optically control magnetism in the system? And can we stabilize magnetic order above TC by driving this high temperature precursor magnetic phase flat? Okay, that's the, the, the goal of the experiment. And so we designed a simple experiment, which is very similar to the one that I showed earlier, except this time carried out in reflection geometry using a magnetic optic Kerr effect instead of the Faraday effect. And here, the MOC signal that I'll show you is going to be proportional to the change in the magnetization induced by the pump. And uh, to drive the lattice in a controllable way, to try to uh, control these uh, spin orbital lattice interactions, we, do, we used a, a tunable uh, narrow band terahertz source so that we can pump various phonon modes. And we'll focus on uh, three modes in this experiment, one at four, one at nine, and one at 16 terahertz, which have different, qualitatively different uh, atomic distortions associated with them. Okay, and so uh, what we first did was try to see what the effect of this phonon pumping would be at low temperatures. So now we start at, at five Kelvin in the ferromagnetic phase. And what I'll show you is the Moog signal as a function of time after pumping different modes. And in particular, what's important to know in this case is that a positive signal is gonna indicate an enhancement of ferromagnetism and the negative signal is gonna indicate a weakening. And what we find is that depending on the phonon that we pump, we either get a positive or negative response, meaning we either enhance or suppress magnet magnetization of the system on a time scale of a few tens of picoseconds. And it actually remains in this non-equilibrium state for several nanoseconds. Okay, and so this was already an exciting result for us because it's the first time that phonon selective control of magnetism has been developed. And it shows that actually, you know, the type of lattice distortion that we drive is important and not just the energy that we deposit in the system. And so now we can um, explore what this non-equilibrium state looks like. We're gonna focus on the nine terahertz pump case, which has the largest effect and find uh, and, and figure out what happens as a function of field and temperature. So first I'll show you what happens as a function of magnetic field at low temperatures. I already showed you that in equilibrium, the magnetic moment saturates below the spin one half limit, even at very low temperatures and high fields, which uh, you know, is suggestive or could be uh, potentially related to the existence of this, of this fluctuating order. Now, when we pump the system, we, we enhance the magnetization. And what I'm showing you here is, is the, the, the raw signal as a function of magnetic field. We can convert these to magnetization. And on the right, I'm showing you in these circles, the total magnetization in the pump induced state uh, as a function of magnetic field. And you can see that now in this non-equilibrium state, the, the magnetization saturates real, nearly right at the spin one half limit. So this suggests that we may be stabilizing fluctuations somehow um, by, by the action of the pump. What's even more suggestive is, is the fluence dependence which shows that the spin one half value of the magnetization is really a hard limit, even when we increase the pump strength. 
And so we find this enhancement below TC. Now we can see what happens um, above TC. We can have, see what happens as a function of temperature. Here I'm just showing you the equilibrium magnetization uh, as a function of temperature again and the equilibrium TC. And now here, the total magnetization of the pump induced state at long time. And what we find is that unlike in the cobalt fluoride case and in other um, you know, experiments on light driven magnets be, that, that have been carried out in the past, the non equilibrium magnetization really does not go away at all at TC and actually persists up to much higher temperatures. It's observable up to at least three times TC in our current measurements. And if we look at the field dependence of this non equilibrium magnetic state, above TC, for example, here at 60 Kelvin, we find it has this ferromagnetic-like spin stiffness, which actually maps very well onto the field dependence that you find uh, below, just below TC, okay? And so this high temperature light-induced magnetic state really looks like a ferromagnet, um, and it can be realized up to, uh, up to more than three times TC. And moreover, this temperature dependence that we find follows that of the short range spin correlations that were measured in equilibrium that I talked about uh, you know, a couple of slides ago. So this is, this is quite suggestive that uh, the type of physics that I described is important to understand this non-equilibrium state. Moreover, now we can see what happens uh, as a function of temperature uh, when we pump the different phonons and we see indeed that there is a phonon selective enhancement or suppression of the onset temperature, the non-equilibrium onset temperature uh, of, of, the, of this light induced ferromagnetic phase, which depends on the phonon that we pump, and it maps onto what we saw at low temperatures. For, for some of the modes, we enhance the, mag, uh, the magnetization and enhance this onset temperature, and, and for uh, other modes, we actually reduce it. Okay. And so the question now is what is leading to this effect? This is very interesting and very exciting, but do we have an idea of actually what's happening and how we can control it? Um, the short answer is no. The long answer is maybe. Uh, we have a couple of ideas. One thing, uh, we, there are a number of things that we know are, cannot explain the effect. For example, uh, one thing we could think about is direct spin and phonon coupling. So the idea of what I talked about earlier changing the lattice um, just changes the exchange interactions through the bond lengths and the bond angles. This, uh, this could be, um, in terms of the driven infrared active modes, this is related, this change in the exchange interaction will be related to a, a function of Q square of the, of the driven mode. And what we know from calculations of uh, first principles calculations is that this effect is actually too small to explain what we see and in many cases actually has the wrong sign. So uh, another thing that we can rule out is heating because we know that we get enhancement whereas heating should uh, in, in principle always decrease the magnetization and we see something that's phonon selective so it's not related just to thermal uh, energy being deposited in the system. We can also rule out other things like optical effects and strain. Uh, and so we, we are left with uh, looking at the strong correlations between the lattice, the orbitals, and the spin. And so the, the model that we, are, uh, the, that we are proposing is one that takes into account this, this spin orbital lattice uh, physics. And we, we've developed <clears throat> with our colleagues at Harvard, a theoretical framework based on the Kugel-Komsky model to, comp to tackle this, this dynamical problem. I'm not gonna go into the details. I just wanna give you a flavor of what, we've, we've, what we think might be at play here. So we have this model where we, we have um, structural, where we take into account the structure, the, the spin super exchange, as well as this, this orbital super exchange. It's been independent, let's say orbital super exchange. And the way we thought about explaining our data was basically to understand that first, the phonon excitation, first the light uh, excites the phonons, which affects the orbitals, and that in turn uh, changes the magnetic order in the system. Okay. Uh, and to just give you a little bit more of a quantitative picture, what we did was to calculate what the ground state of the system is. Um, we can parameterize the orbital state in terms of two so-called orbital angles, theta and phi. And then we can kind of make a fictitious scenario, which is to understand what would, what would the magnetic ground state be if we froze all the other degrees of freedom and just vary the orbital angles by hand, right? 
And so not surprisingly, what you find when you do this is this kind of magnetic phase diagram is a function of these orbital angles and you get lots of different magnetic phases. Okay, most of these are not physically accessible. They would, they would correspond to, to uh, way too large changes in the orbital angle. But if you zoom in um, uh, near, uh, sorry, and if you put the, where the equilibrium state of yttrium titanate is, it lives right here on this phase boundary between these two uh, magnetic states, this ferromagnetic and this antiferromagnetic phase. And if we zoom in here, sorry for the change in the color scale, you can see just how close to the phase boundary the system lies in equilibrium. Okay, and this you can think of as a source of the strong fluctuations that we talked about. And so what we, what we hypothesize or what we propose is that what happens when we pump the system is that we drive, we drive the orbital state either farther to or farther from or closer to this phase boundary, which affects, uh, which either amplifies or, or suppresses the influence of these magnetic fluctuations, thereby weakening or enhancing ferromagnetic order. And so to recap, in the best case scenario, we can use this type of um, orbital, this type of lattice coupling to the orbitals uh, to increase the effective transition temperature in, in atrium titanate up to three times, which one can think of as kind of resurrecting the ideal ferromagnetic ground state of YTO in the absence of these uh, frustrated interactions. Okay, so let me just, sorry, let me just wrap up now. Um, this is kind of where we are now, but I think um, it's an exciting place to be and I hope what I was able to convey to you here is a very simple takeaway message at the end of the day with these examples, which is that driving the crystal structure um, with light provides a, a really powerful way to control functional properties, in this case, magnetism. And ultimately what we've developed is a toolbox that can be used to um, selectively uh, target and enhance the properties of materials by shining light on them. Um, and so before I, I finally wrap up, I wanna make, so it's probably the most important slide, which is an advertisement. As I said, I'm moving to Cornell. And so I'm looking to, to grow my group. So if there are any students or potential students or postdocs out there with interest in some of the work that we've done, um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... I like the stuff that is sunny in Ithaca at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot that's, more snow than that. That's the only that. picture that I can choose, <laughs> otherwise people get scared away. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Um, so let me uh, bring Sankita up and Alexander and Sasha. Um, so uh, Sankita, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, hi, okay, that was a very nice talk, thank you. I have two questions. One is about you are talking. You were talking about this IR active modes and and Raman active modes. Is there also a possibility using the nonlinearity to go no, to finite Q, so not just comma point modes? Is yeah. that possible to excite them? Yes, yes. This is this is possible. It's sort of the next frontier, the next things that we're starting to think about, and um, it's it's basically you can do this by going to the next order instead of looking at third order, if you look at fourth order, and specifically uh, interactions that involve uh, Q square, Q square. Okay. Uh, if you do this, then basically you can couple to any mode at finite Q. So let's say you have QIR square and QR square. Now, uh, typically this wouldn't be uh, necessarily, uh, sorry, this is now allowed in basically any material and basically tells you that uh, you can you can use this to excite phonons at any Q, plus and minus Q, right? And, uh, and basically uh, this term uh, would excite essentially all the phonons at all Qs, plus and minus Q, uh, but you're, you're then selective based on, let's say, what's the density of states at that particular uh, wave vector. Right, right. Uh, uh, and then the second thing is that we were trying to explain it with with this exchange and super exchange, which are very much uh, equilibrium concept. On the other hand, you are really, you stressed this point as well, you are highly non-equilibrium situation. So um, is, is this the right way to explain it? It's a, it's a good point. I, I think in ultimately it's not, it's just the intuition that we start with, right? Because 
you know, what we know very well is equilibrium physics. And so we try to start with this intuition and see if we can build a model that's somehow based on that. But what we find is actually that ultimately we can't explain everything in this way. So I, I just, I use this kind of cartoon equilibrium picture where we're, we're kind of moving the orbitals around, we're changing their orbital degree of freedom by driving a lattice, which changes the fluctuations. In reality, when we try to do these calculations quantitatively by putting in the lattice distortions and seeing what happens, we actually don't get very good agreement. And I, that is largely because we are not in a, an equilibrium system. We have to take into account dynamics. We have to take into account uh, a lot of other non-equilibrium effects. And so, you know, we're, we're still trying to understand the best way to model it, but it's, it's a very good point. The equilibrium, it, it's, it's a good, I think it's a good starting point to give us a handle on what is maybe the basic physics, but one shouldn't really take that too seriously at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. I could maybe just look at the local current and you might be able to explain this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Shasha, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask a question, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk as usual. Uh, I have a question about second part about uh, Ethereum Titanite. So um, uh, in your data, you see that there is kind of uh, quite a long time of the buildup of, of this enhanced uh, state. Uh, while you explain everything based on the very high frequency phonons. So how do you match these two time scales, let's say? Okay, yeah, yeah. so I'm just gonna pull up the time scale. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a good point. So you see something that you know, has a rise time of like you know, 20, 10, 20 picoseconds, something like that. Um, whereas, as you say, the phonon frequency is very fast. What it turns out to be, and I don't have the slide here, I, I should have I kept it, is if you compare the rise time, you fit these rise times and you compare it to the phonon lifetime, so the sort of the lifetime of the coherent oscillations, you find something that matches very closely. These, all of these um, have slightly different rise times. They're, they're you know, within the same ballpark, but um, the higher frequency one is a little faster uh, th than the lower frequency one. And this corresponds very well to the, the lifetime of the phonons. And so the, what it looks like is the rise time is uh, somehow integrating over all of the, uh, the coherent phonon uh, lifetime uh, uh, while that coherent phonon is being driven. So that, just, that explains, I think, why this is a particularly long time scale. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thomas? Uh... Can you unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Uh, thank you for the talk. I, I have a question related to the second part. Uh, I was wondering whether you tried to do excitation also at optical frequencies. What do, do you get some enhancement or, or you haven't tried? Yeah, so we did this um, with with the fundamental of our laser with 800 nanometers as well. And in, in, in that case, you just get a kind of a weakening or a, a, a destruction of, of, of ferromagnetism. You, you cannot completely kill it, but you, you mainly just are getting a, a weakening of it. Uh, it always goes in, in this negative direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it cannot be related to some uh, strain effects due to heating of the excited volume. No, yes. Yeah. So strain effects we think cannot explain it, mainly because of that, and also because of um, the the time scale. I, we we have, for example, if you just look at optical reflectivity, okay, not the the mode signal, but just the isotropic reflectivity, you can see the indication that there is a strain wave. You can start. You can see uh, acoustic oscillations corresponding with the the uh, strain launched in the uh, in the volume that you're exciting. But we don't see any indications of that coming through in our magnetic data. OK, thank you. Very well. Uh, Marek, uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? I don't know if, uh, OK, maybe he's not available. Marek, OK, he has his hand up, but uh, and he's allowed to be talked to, but he doesn't. OK, so I guess the question may not come. <laughs> Uh, Mark, uh, okay, I guess not. Um, okay, so I think that's the last. Oh, do you have a sorry? Go ahead, uh, uh, Davide. Uh, Divine, sorry, go ahead, ask your question. Hi, uh, great talk. I had a quick question about the um, uterum titanate. So, about TC, do, is there a structural transition? No. And, okay, so 
Okay, so there is no change in the phonon um, spectrum above TC, which will. No, no, there there hasn't been detected at any temperature that's been measured so far a structural phase transition in atrium type. At TC, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if there was and um, the, the excitation from the, the optical excitation was driving it into a different phase because different phase. Was... yeah no in 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 reality yeah I think the phase trans the structural phase transition if there is one is a much much higher temperature okay excellent well, I'm going to stop the streaming now and uh...